So the next aspect we can go over is the chemical shift. Uh, so first of all, more substituted carbons tend to be somewhat further downfield. More substituted hydrogens and more substituted carbons are a little bit further downfield. So we could write that like this. Carbons on, hydrogens on a tertiary carbon would be a little bit to the left compared to hydrogens on a secondary carbon. And that would be a little bit to the left compared to hydrogens on a primary carbon. So more substituted carbons downfield. Hydrogens on more substituted carbons are a little bit downfield, which we know means to the left. For example, how many beats would you expect here? Two. And who's going to be further to the left, the A peak or the B peak? Whoops. The A peak. Would that be further to the left? Uh, no, that's further to the right, sorry. Good. So roughly speaking, the printout would look like this. The A, car the A hydrogens are on a primary carbon whereas the B hydrogens are on a secondary carbon. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the B hydrogen should be a little bit to the left. It's not a big difference, but the B hydrogens are a little bit to the left compared to the A. So roughly speaking, the printout would look like this. By the way, what we're going to talk about now is the horizontal position of the peaks. That's the chemical shift. However, you might maybe have already guessed, what about the vertical height? Well, the vertical height just represents how many hydrogens are absorbing at each peak. So why did I draw the A higher than the B? Well, the A represents six hydrogens. But how many hydrogens does the B represent? Two. Two. So that's why this peak should be lower than this peak over here. So that's the third piece of information that you can get from the proton NMR. The second piece is the horizontal position, the chemical shift. That's what we're focusing on now, but we might as well look ahead and see that the third piece of information is the height of the peak. Well, the height of the peak tells you how many hydrogens are represented by that absorption. So clearly, if there's more hydrogens, that would be a higher peak, roughly speaking. So we won't talk too much about the heights of the peak right now, but uh, that's a little sideline there. By the way, this is a CH2 group, but these are still equivalent because there's no stereocenters. Remember, hydrogens in a CH2 group are only non-equivalent if there's a stereocenter in the molecule. So you were right that these were equivalent to each other. Most CH2 hydrogens are equivalent. It's only when there's a stereocenter in the molecule that they're non-equivalent. OK, so substitution pulls the hydrogens somewhat downfield. That's not a very big effect, but that's an effect. Now here's a more important effect. Remember that how do we get the absorptions? We start with a low magnetic field, and we increase the magnetic field until it's big enough for an absorption to occur. We increase the magnetic field until it's big enough for an absorption to occur. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, of course, all of these nuclei are surrounded by electrons. All these nuclei are surrounded by electrons in the molecule. And it turns out that electrons shield you from magnetic fields. The effect of the electrons is that the electrons shield nuclei. From the external magnetic field. Electrons shield the nuclei from the external magnetic field. So let's say that there are many electrons around you. If there's many electrons around you, does that mean you're well-shielded or de-shielded? You're well-shielded. In that case, 
how big of an external magnetic field will it take to get through to the nucleus, so to speak? Are we going to need a bigger than normal external magnetic field or a smaller external field to have an effect on that nucleus? That's right. This word shielded, I think, is pretty intuitive. If you're well shielded from the magnetic field, it takes a big magnetic field to have an impact. shielded nucleus is shielded from the magnetic field, so it takes a big magnet magnetic field to have an impact and to have an absorption. On the other hand, suppose that you have few electrons in the environment. Well, we would call that deshielded, because the electrons provide shielding. That would be deshielded, and do we need a big or a small magnetic field now to get the absorption? Small. Only a small one, because there's not much shielding to get through. You need only a small magnetic field for an absorption. That would be a peak. So going back to here, if you're well shielded, would you expect the peak to be on the right-hand side of the printout or the left-hand side? So well shielded, you need a larger magnetic field, so it would be on the left-hand side. Now let's go back to our notations here. Wait, I'm sorry. Yeah? <laughs> the right-hand side. That's right, because the right-hand side is upfield, high magnetic field. So it's smaller than the number the higher the field. Okay. That's right. Notice that, unfortunately, the chemical shift scale is different from the magnetic field shift scale. Mm -hmm. So in order, if you have many electrons and you're well shielded, if you need a big magnetic field, the peak would be over here at the high magnetic field region, mm -hmm. which means a low chemical shift. Unfortunately, they decided to define high magnetic field as a low chemical shift because they decided to have the numbers going from right to left. Okay. Whereas, if you're deshielded, if you have few electrons, should your peak be on the left or the right? And actually, that's kind of how I have it in the board and how you should have it in your notes. You should have these notes underneath the left-hand side of the axis, and you should have these notes underneath the right-hand side. Because when you're in this situation, you get the peak on the right-hand side, and when you're in this situation, you get the peak on the left-hand side. So shielded and deshielded are terms that are used a lot when people are talking about NMR. So it's important to realize if something is shielded, is it on the right or the left-hand side? That's right. Shielded is the right-hand side, which means upfield, which means low chemical shift. And if something is deshielded, it's on the left-hand side, which is downfield, which is a high chemical shift. So the best thing is to simply have in your notes this axis with this word, this word, and these words on the left. And on the right-hand side, you should have this term, this term, and these terms on the right. And then you simply keep that in your notes. When you take the exam, is it open book, uh, open notes or closed notes? It's closed notes. So I would simply. Uh, drill myself on being able to come up with what I have on the board on your own. In fact, this might be a good thing to write on a piece of paper at the beginning of the exam. Write an axis like this and write down the terms that describe the left-hand side of the axis for memory and then write down the terms that describe the right-hand side of the axis for memory. That way you don't have to keep figuring them out over and over again during the exam. Now, I said that if there's few electrons around you, you would be deshielded. But why would there be few electrons? Well, if there's something else in the molecule that's pulling the electrons away from you, that's what would deshield you. If there's some other atom that's pulling the electrons away from you, that's what would deshield you. example, this is very electronegative. Right. It's going to pull a lot of the electron density onto itself. 
away from the hydrogens. This is going to be pulling the electrons towards itself and away from the hydrogens. So it's going to deshield all of the hydrogens. This fluorine is going to deshield all of the hydrogens. But which of the hydrogens would it have the biggest impact on? The ones right next to it. Yeah, these ones will also be deshielded, but it will be a smaller effect because they're pretty far away. So electronegative atoms always cause deshielding on all of the hydrogens in the molecule, but they have by far the biggest effect on the hydrogens that they're right next to. So with these, uh, how many peaks do we expect here, by the way? Three. Let's call these A, B, and C. 